just pre-consumable food waste. Uh, you can see it's kind of got a little purple tint to it right now. We had a load of raspberries that came in this morning. They all get mixed in. We take everything in here from waste artificial crab, ravioli, grease trap, um, vitamins, all kind, of, all of that kind of stuff that we that we're allowed to take, we take. Um, there, there's two re two main reasons for it. One reason is that keeps it out of the landfill. Because if it wasn't coming to us, it would go straight to a landfill. The second reason is with the with the grease, fats, and oils that are in a lot of our food products also have gas value in them. So especially like a grease trap type material um, has a lot of grease value with the way, and this is with our job as technicians, this is a huge part of it because with the greases, you start pumping them in. If you get your mixture off, you can really screw up your gas quality. Um, Edeline, the site we were just at, they're run on cow manure only. Their gas quality usually holds pretty constant at about 56 to 58 percent methane. On this site, with taking these substrates, I can range from 48 percent all the way up to 62 percent or higher gas quality, which the engine cannot self-adjust for that. So that's a large part of our job to try and keep that as balanced and as consistent as possible to keep the whole site running. Um, we, are, we are limited on the amount of substrate, substrates we can take. The, the current regulations are 30% substrates and 70% manure. Too. So if you take your total volume you pump in a, in a day, only 30% of it can be water. Um, the one beneficial part of this to the owners is if these substrates were going to go to a landfill, they'd have to pay per pound to take them. While we can take them, the owners still make a little bit of money on the tipping fees and we can charge less than, than the landfills charge and, and still get a profit out of them. Go ahead. Does it all come from like food processing plants in Walker County? Or um, a lot of stuff, a lot of the grease we get here comes from Canada, being so close. We do take wastewater and wash water from Nature's Path, the, the cereal plant, as well as Dairy Gold right down the road here and a lot of Whatcom County places. That's why when I had the question earlier of is, is it, do we see potential for more digesters in Whatcom County? The substrates is where a lot of the money is made. Um, with there's a total of four digesters in the county already and trying to balance out those substrates, we run, run low. We could take more at every site, um, which makes the sites more profitable. Uh, if there was a market for more substrates, there would probably be more digesters that went in. Maybe if you touch the base, they, they can only take pre-consumable. Yep. Okay. Yep. There is no, it's only pre-consumable waste. There is no no, po nothing post-consumable, so no food after, I mean, even if Can't you eat restaurant. that granola, yeah, even if you eat that granola bar, you go to a restaurant, I cannot take those food scraps. Um, Unless it's in the grease trap. Unless it's grease trap, yep. Um, also, no human waste of any sort, you know, nothing like that. <laughs> you, know, oh, sorry. you mentioned that there's a certain ratio that you have to have. Yep. Manure versus pre yeah, pre versus substrates. Pre consumption, yeah. Did you, you ever, how do you balance that? Is there ever a time when you're lacking or you've got to turn people away? How do you? Um, we have a, actually, Vanderhawks have a person that does that and balances it per site because our, our manure flow never usually goes below a certain level. Right. You know, because based on how many cows you have, your manure flow is going to be a consistent level. It can go up, but that's never going to change the ratio right. of what we do. Do you have plenty of the other substrate coming in, or do you have to turn people back, or you sometimes need to recruit? Uh, we're always re recruiting more, because okay. we, tr we try and balance the substrates between all the sites, and there's there's never enough to make every site okay. at 30%. Because there's going to be seasonal times, like when berries Correct. are happening and other things are happening. Yeah. Okay. So why does it have to be pre-consumption? Um, because of the bacterias and 
and the whole, uh, basically, uh, digesters in that 70 to 30 percent ratio, uh, they get uh, solid waste exemption. So basically, they're not considered a solid waste facility if they're under that 30 percent and they take pre-consumer food waste. Now, if they want, they probably could take post-consumer the other one, but then you got to go through the solid waste permit. You got to get a permit, then you're more regulated and other things, and that's something that dairy doesn't want. Yeah. Doesn't the isn't that solid waste permit? That's only given by the waste management, isn't Correct. it? It's not. Correct. They've got the ability to, and they kind of control uh, mini monopoly there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They don't like to give those out. Nope. So there's only so much of it around. Do they ever like, you know, who wants to pay the most? Uh, you know, have contracts with them? You always you always try and get as much as you can for it. The problem is is. The dumps also, the landfills also want it too. Right. You know, so it's it's the trying to keep everybody happy of, well, we'll keep our price as high as we can, but still be below the next yeah, guy. Yeah, somebody's smiling. Yeah, too. yeah, correct. You know, the benefit of this is, you know, it's not going in the landfill. Right. You're getting gas from it. You're getting the tipping fee from it. And then they can also land apply whatever nutrients that are left back on their land. Now, they also have to, uh, each dairy has a nutrient management plan, so they gotta have so many acres for so many cows, and they know they're tested, and, and they go through the uh, process, so they know how much nutrients that they can, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, that they can put on their fields. So they gotta know that these substrates that they're taking in, what they contain in nitrogen and phosphorus, that they don't overload and have enough land Right. Now, with uh, with these other substrates coming in, do you guys do uh, testing on it before you accept it? I mean, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for getting something that's going to just totally screw up your uh, digester. We they test every substrate before, you know. Most of the times, it's like, hey, I got this. Can you guys take it? Well, we'll run tests on it to make sure it's not going to have a harmful impact. Right. But. Yes, once in a while a load slips through or or something doesn't get tested and you put it in and there's been numerous occasions where you have a site that's putting out 850 mega or 850 kilowatts and you take one bad load of substrates and for instance that site ran at about 50 kilo or yeah, 50 kilowatts for almost a week Ooh. which is really is that painful. yogurt one? Remember Freer was talking about that? No, it was it was a different one, but yeah, there's it's it's a real balancing act and that's where we spend a lot of time trying to make sure everything's on the up and up and it won't be harmful to us. Are all these trucks bringing stuff in? No, they're no. all hauling out. All hauling out. Okay. I think they're all all waiting here cuz the pump in the lagoon yeah, broke. <laughs> So they kind of got backed up, but they're, they're all pumping out of the lagoon and spreading on the fields. Okay. This guy's pulling out? No, he's pulling out of the lagoon, which is right over the hill. Oh, for fertilization on the field? For, yeah, to so spread manure. This. No, this, okay. all this pit gets pumped in underneath the cows, mixes okay. with the manure under there, and then gets pumped right. into the digester. We would see trucks pulling into here. Yeah, he would pull, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You wouldn't want to be standing right here yeah. if they were dumping right there. Gotcha. So all these jars represent the different uh, areas of separation after the digester vessel and the nutrient recovery system. Uh, this jar represents the influent material of the substrates and the manure that enter the digester vessel. Uh, this is usually goes in about six to eight percent total solids. Uh, after it goes through the digestion process in the 22 day uh, retention time, uh, this is the effluent that comes out. Uh, it's usually about a 45 to 50 percent reduction in total solids. So if it's going into six to eight percent, it's coming out at you know three to four percent. And then uh, after the digestion process, the effluent gets sent over to a separator where it separates a portion of the liquids and a portion of the solids out. Uh, these are the solids that are left over uh, after that separation process. Uh, these solids are used for uh, bedding for the dairy of the animals. They're also used for 
uh, they can either sell it as a peat moss replacement to, um, to uh, neighboring uh, nurseries. Uh, this process here is the, uh, the nutrient recovery effluent. So after it goes through the nutrient recovery process and before it goes into uh, the settling lane, this is the effluent that comes out of that. And then the last portion of it is the settled pea solids is what we call them that settle out in that settling lane. Uh, basically this is the leftover, uh, any leftover nitrogen uh, and phosphorus that are left over uh, settle out in this process and then they do the uh, scoop it out with a loader and uh, dry it out and then they can use this to spread on the fields that are lower in these uh, these chemicals. Okay. Once the manure has gone through its 21 day cycle in the digester it gets pumped from there straight to the separator. This is a slope screen separator with a dewatering auger on it. So with Besides the pump feeding it, it requires very little power to try and separate the water off of it besides the auger. <clears throat> once, once it falls down the screen, it goes through the dewatering auger. There's a plug on the end which compresses it and packs it really tight to try and squeeze the rest of the water that it can possibly get out of it. So when that happens, this is what we get when that happens. <laughs> it is... It is a fair, on this side is a fairly dry solids. Here they use the majority of that solids for bedding. They haul that act over to the farm and put it back into the cow stalls because the majority of the pathogens have been killed. And it also, the digester also takes the majority of the smell out of it. <clears throat> this stuff seemed, it uh, evaporates the water off fairly fast. So when you put it in the stalls, it dries out and becomes becomes like a a sawdust type material. So um, how does this uh, material, where you're taking in a lot of uh, other substrates, compare to uh, what it looks like coming out of the Edeline dairy, which is only cow manure? Um, they're fairly similar. I mean, as long as the digester is doing its job and breaking down all your fats and greases and everything that we're putting in. Right. It's fairly similar. Looks wise, it, it looks totally different because it's a different style separator. Over there, instead of the dewatering auger, they have rollers that it goes through, so everything's packed flat. But it's it's fairly close. Okay. Well, this isn't what like cold stuff stuff is They, one of, our di one of the digesters that we're not associated with actually has a pellet machine to turn that into wood pellets. But wood, wood pellets are made from wood, you know, right. and they're, they're just compacted out of sawdust. But, but this, yeah, you, couldn't, you can't burn. It has to be really dry in order to make pellets, though. Might be a little. Um, what else is there on solids? Uh, over at Edeline, Another advantage to a digester, over at Edeline, they used to always bed with sawdust. We've cut out about a $10,000 a month sawdust bill from, from them being able to use the fiber off of the material they already had. That's awesome. So, so how much of the potential profits from having a digester is reduction in other costs? A lot of it. Like you make more money by stuff you don't have to buy rather than stuff you can sell from um, the process? Well, it depends on how much you know, if you have nutrient recovery associated with it, like here, you have a pretty good savings in fiber without having to buy sawdust. Um, your application in the fields and that kind of stuff still all stays the same. Here with the nutrient recovery system, we are able to recover some of the nutrients to make a concentrated formula or a concentrated fertilizer. fertilizer. So he's not having to go out and buy for commercial grade right. fertilizer for it. So there is some saves costs from it um, percentage I'm not real sure of. You guys are pretty close to being like self-sustaining except for the food for the dairy cows coming in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me it's... Correct, like, except for the... Yeah, you can, yeah. You can make except for the plant seed, I mean, because we have the fertilizer for the fields right. and... Yeah. 
So it's it's close, and that's you know that's why it is called a green power because not only are we are we using something that normally goes up into the atmosphere, and we're saving that from going up there, but the other products that we can make as well. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, kind of specialized equipment do you need to, if you reach a point where you can start exporting, for lack of a better word, the biogas, what kind of extra technology or stuff do you need to have that, either to compress it into a, like a tanker truck, or to get it off-site to be used by somebody, uh, you know, not locally, but yeah. farther away, like how complicated a process the problem. is, I know that natural gas, it's really expensive to compress it yeah. and then to transport it even farther you have to do it liquid, yeah. which is insanely expensive. Yeah. So how do the economics of that, fact, like is it just going to be yeah. way too... It, it, we're actually working on a, a new site is in the proposal plan to do a compressed natural gas or a, a CNG. Um, they're working through all the numbers on whether it's feasible or not, but it's it's that's a whole different science being able to handle the gas. Yeah, that's that's like a, an oil refining. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't have exact because answers. Because it's great on to use the gas on site or close by yeah. that you can pipe it to. Yeah. But that only works as a local. Yeah. Or a localized. Correct. Solution. It doesn't Correct. really. Take the potential what what they're what they're the wanting to do is turn the gas into a certain point where they can just put it right in the natural gas pipeline, so there wouldn't be any trucking involved. So you'd add it to the existing. You'd gas add it to the, exi the existing natural gas, the gas infrastructure. From Vanderhoff Farm would be powering, you know, a house that's on the local. Correct. Natural you, gas bridge. you wouldn't be selling it to Seattle or something. Why it would go? It would mix it and see like now. We produce a green power, electric power, but that power really just goes back onto, onto the lines, the onto the grid, and then, you know, and so that it would be the same scenario with natural gas. They you, you, wouldn't want you to do it. You'd essentially be adding. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. But they, it's just like the power company, they are willing to work with us on that because the power company essentially doesn't need our power, but. You know, because of the tax breaks and that kind of stuff, they say, you know what, we want your power because it helps us. Well, eventually it'll be feasible. Look at the fracking going on in the Midwest. Yeah. Yep. So gas in a certain oil at a certain price Correct. wasn't even thought of. Correct. Now they're going to get Yeah. So you'd end up, once digesters become more prolific, you'd almost have lots of little natural or CNG plants. Correct. Rather than having one big facility, yeah. you have lots of little ones yeah. contributing to the grid. Yeah, because if you, just like digesters, if you have <coughs> one big one, well then you now you have to pipe all that manure to a location. One. Well, if it's CNG or whatever, you still have the cost to pump it. Right. You know, so um, versus multiple little ones that you can just tie right in. Be a whole lot cheaper. A little co-op. Yeah, pretty much. So it would it would work for an area where there's like an agri agricultural area where there's yeah. lots of little lots of small farms. Yeah. Lots of small farms, even lots of big farms. Yeah. But it wouldn't work. Correct. Well, thank you. No problem, Andy. Everyone, let's uh, thank Andy and Mike. Really appreciate your time today. Yeah, yeah, no it's problem. Really informative. We look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming out. Thanks. Yep. I'll be hey, in Thursday. Thursday, yeah. So Looking forward if, to it.